All right, so I'm going to talk to you guys today about something that is a passion of mine, and that is snakes. How many of you guys like snakes? Yay, the numbers of people are increasing. How many of you are afraid of snakes? You are not alone, and you can like them and be afraid of them at the same time, too, and that, that's fine. Now, I am a Southern California girl, born and raised, and how does a Southern California girl get from the beach to treating a 16-foot Indian rock python in Sri Lanka? <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about that just a little bit today. <clears throat> so snakes are probably one of the most mysterious animals on the earth. They, throughout time, throughout cultures, People have had fears about snakes. There have been all kinds of myths and mysteries. And, and it, it's just, it's something that is deeply ingrained in us somehow that we have some kind of a connection with these animals, either negative or positive. You know, most of the people I meet, they either are really fascinated by snakes or they just can't stand them. And there's a lot of people out there that even seem to have some kind of a built-in fear of snakes that just almost goes beyond reason. I mean, they don't even have legs. I mean, seriously. So to, to me, and this is just my theory, my theory is that so many people are afraid of snakes because it's actually built into our biology somehow. You know how they're doing all this research now on, on DNA and you know, maybe you're more likely to be an alcoholic or you're more likely to be addicted to drugs just because of your DNA, the same as the color of your eyes type of thing. Well, I almost think that there's maybe something like that that could be explored with snakes. And it probably has to do with, if you go way back to the beginning of human existence when we're, we were hunting and gathering, if you came across a snake, and it was venomous, it could potentially kill you. So who cared about whether it was venomous or a non-venomous snake that was perfectly harmless? The best thing to do is just stay away from all of them, right? Because who wanted to take that chance or experiment? Gee, is this the non-venomous one or the venomous one that can kill me? You know, they're, they're not gonna do that. So this leads me on to the topic that I wanna present to you guys today, which is the global burden of venomous snake bite. You know, in the, in the news, all throughout the media, you know, there's all these terrific organizations out there that are doing a lot for global health in, in the world today. And I'm sure you've heard just a whole lot of information about um, ailments like AIDS, HIV, TB, malaria, but nobody really hears about venomous snake bite. And that's a curious thing because venomous snake bite probably kills hundreds of thousands of people per year, in, mostly in developing countries, and it's something that we actually have the cure for. We have the technology to remedy this situation and to stop people from dying from venomous snake bite. So the regions that are most affected by venomous snake bite are Central and South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and South Asia all around in this area here. Now, Central and South America is kind of an unusual case because they've actually been on top of this snake bite problem from the beginning. There are hundreds of thousands of people that are bitten down there, but there's also some really fantastic antivenoms and they've really kind of figured out the whole angle on, on snake bite treatment. We have groups in Costa Rica that are manufacturing some of the best top quality antivenoms, which is the treatment for venomous snake bite. They're, they're manufacturing some of the top, most top quality antivenoms in the world at a very affordable price for their people. The same with Brazil and Colombia. They also have really terrific programs. But you come to Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, anywhere around Nigeria, all the way down, they have some you know, really venomous snake species there. Of course, we have very venomous snake species here in the United States too. But there was some research that was just published within the last couple of months to show that 
probably about one and a half million people are bitten by snakes per year in Africa, and they have about they have the antivenom to treat only about 10% of those people that are bitten. And part of the problem of this is, is economics. The pharmaceutical companies, the drug companies that were manufacturing the antivenoms, they've discovered as time has gone along that it doesn't really pay for them. It, it's not something that makes them money. It's not like you know, the treatments for wrinkles or finding a cure for baldness or something like that. It's not gonna make them hundreds of millions of dollars overnight. Matter of fact, a lot of them were losing money on it, so what did they do? They decided, well, we're just not gonna do it anymore. Well, what does that mean? It means the 1.5 million people in Africa who are bitten by venomous snakes every year don't have anything to treat them. There hasn't been a whole lot of studies that have been done to show what the problem is like in Asia. There's no real concrete evidence, but we know for a fact that hundreds of thousands of people are bitten in Asia every year. And again, just like Africa, hundreds and thousands of people are also succumbing to snake bite. So who are the people that are being bitten by venomous snakes? Well, for the most part, they're living in the rural areas of these developing countries. They're working in the rice paddies, out agricultural in the fields. These are some pictures that were taken from a previous trip to Sri Lanka. And you can't see very well, but um, these rice paddy workers, they're using their bare hands and they have no shoes on their feet. They're walking through the marshy rice paddy with no protection. And the rice, of course, attracts the rodents, and the rodents attract the snakes. And so they're literally putting their hands and feet right down into the most likely area where you're gonna find a venomous snake. So the probabilities of them getting bit bitten are very high. Also, you'll find dwellings like this. This is called a waddle and daub house and it's basically kind of like an adobe that's put together from mud and branches. And little animals, you know, geckos and mice and things can climb into the little cracks and nooks in the house and live in there. Well, at night, that's where the snakes go too, right into the house. And they especially have problems in Sri Lanka with the common crates, which is, you know, a small little long, thin black snake, but it has a very highly potent venom. And when the people are sleeping, usually on the floor, they roll over, they're bitten by the snake. They may not even know it. They may not even wake up the next morning. <clears throat> so the results when a snake bites, um, of course it can be death, but then it also causes a lot of disabilities. And I'm gonna show you a couple of slides that maybe have some you know, a little bit gruesome pictures on it. So I'm sure you guys probably see worse things than in playing your video games every day, but I just wanted to give you that warning. So what causes the problems when a venomous snake bites? Well, snakes, you have to understand, venomous snakes have a lot of different kinds of toxins in their venom. And it's not the kind of thing where, okay, there's venomous snakes and they're all the same. Each species has different toxins in their venom, and even each individual snake can have different toxins in their venom. And these toxins are like neurotoxins that attack your central nervous system and can cause you to stop breathing, or cytotoxins, which means it just destroys your cells, or hemotoxins that destroy your blood cells, even toxins that attack certain organs in your body, like cardiotoxins that can attack your heart. And so understand that any particular snake can have more than one of these toxins in the venom also. It's not just one toxin. They can have multiple toxins working all together. So you understand it's very complex. So this is the result of those toxins. You know, this, this would be a prime example of what we would call a cytotoxic venom where it's just basically destroyed that tissue. So unfortunately, this person had to have their leg amputated above the knee 
And this was all caused by a bite from this particular sn snake, the Ferdelance, which causes a lot of problems in Central and South America. So these are some bites from a Mozambique spitting cobra in Swaziland. And you can just see the, the devastating effects of that venom. So you, you just have to understand that once you make it through the initial consequences of a snake bite, you know, you survive the actual bite, this is what people have to put up with after that. So as you can understand, go back to the picture of the people that are working in that rice paddy. How could they do that if they didn't have an arm or a leg? It would be pretty difficult. You know, snake bite can mean the lo loss of a person's life, a family member, a mother, a father, a child. You know, if, if, if a family loses their primary wage earner, who may have only been making $2 per day, that $2 per day is everything for them in their world. You know, what do they do after that? So what do we do after that? Well, that's what our organization, Animal Venom Research International, is trying to help with. And we believe that every country has the right to have its own species-specific antivenom. And when we talk about species-specific, we talk about antivenoms that need to be made from the species of snakes where people live. Remember how I talked about all the different toxins and venom and how they're different depending on which species the snake is and even the individual snake? Well, what we want to do is create antivenoms using the snakes right from around a person's area, getting a really good distribution of a, a geographic range of snakes to extract venom from because you need the venom in order to create the antivenom. So our vision is that every country has this and that we do it, set it up in such a way that it eliminates reliance on outside resources so they don't have to, say, buy an antivenom from another country and ship it in. And also it will create economic advantages because you set up something like a sustainable antivenom program in a country, you're creating jobs for people you're keeping the money within that country. Just to give you an example, our current focus project is the island nation of Sri Lanka. Well, Sri Lanka spends about one million US dollars on antivenoms that they buy from India. The antivenoms in India are made from the same snakes that you would, tip, you would think you would find in Sri Lanka. There's you know, spectacled cobras, crates, Russell's vipers. Yeah, they have all those snakes in India too. But the problem is because Sri Lanka is an island that's been cut off from everywhere else for thousands and thousands of years, literally the snakes on that island, the venom of those snakes on that island is completely different than the snakes that you find on mainland India and in, in Asia. And so when you, you try to use the antivenoms from India on people who've been bitten by snakes in Sri Lanka, doesn't matter if it's a, it's a cobra, they call it a spectacled cobra and it looks the same, it doesn't work the same way. There have been recorded cases of people being treated with antivenoms in Sri Lanka and having to be administered up to 50 vials of an antivenom, 60 vials. The typical treatment for any one person should be five vials. So one of the reasons why we picked Sri Lanka as a focal point is because Sri Lanka has one of the highest death rates due to venomous snake bite in the world. And we're at the point now where we've actually built a serpentarium in Sri Lanka. We have field collection teams that are going out right now that are collecting these snakes strategically from different locations all over the country. So our next step is going to be that we're going to extract the venom from those snakes and we're going to create the species-specific antivenom. But we're not going to do this alone. We're not doing this as just a standalone nonprofit organization. We're working with other partners like the University of Costa Rica, Clodomiro Picado Institute. 
They're the ones that I was telling you they, in um, Costa Rica, Central America, they're developing some of the best antivenoms out there right now. So they're another government-run humanitarian organization. They're willing to jump right on board with us and help us do this, walk us through the process that they've already done and mastered, and, help, and actually trans, help us transfer this technology to Sri Lanka. So then we're gonna ship the venom to Costa Rica. In order to make a project like this successful, we've had to engage a lot of other partners too within Sri Lanka. We've got government support, we've got the support from their local universities too. And we also have to get support from the religious community, the Buddhist community is, is very influential in Sri Lanka. And we can't just go over there with the idea that we're going to replace all of their traditional medical practices and things like that. We have to do it in a way where we gain their trust and let them know that um, this just might be a good alternative for them. Otherwise, they're not going to trust us and they're not going to buy into it. So antivenoms are made by injecting other animals with small amounts of venom. Usually you use horses or sheep, and then you collect the antibodies from those animals and you refine them, and that's how the antibody, or that's how the antivenom is created. I just wanna give one last uh, nod to conservation of these snakes. You know, a lot of people think, well, you know, venomous snakes, if they're a problem, why don't we just eradicate them all? Well, something that you have to understand is that they all have their part that they play in the ecosystem. And it doesn't matter where we live, whether we live in a country like Sri Lanka or whether we live here, a place like here in the United States, they're all valuable. And one of the things that they've been finding with more recent research too, is that the toxins in these venoms that can hurt us can also help us as well. So they're, they're actually finding that um, some of these venom toxins can help people that have heart conditions or uh, diabetes or cancer or some of these other things. So I wanted to show you uh, this one today. This is actually a um, red diamond rattlesnake, and it lives here in the hills right around Riverside. And I also work, my day job is that I work for, a, um, for the Riverside Animal Services. And we get calls in the spring and summertime every day from people that want us to come and remove these snakes from their property. And it's because they're afraid of them. They don't understand what these snakes can do and what their capabilities are. And the unfortunate thing is that most of these snakes end up being killed because we're building into their habitats you know, we're, we're mowing it over to put in our fancy houses up on the hills. And then the people that move into those houses don't learn how to coexist with these animals. And so it, it's a really unfortunate thing because we're losing a lot with this. We're losing a lot by not preserving these animals. And I have a feeling that within the next few years, even species like this one, this red diamond, is probably become, be gonna become threatened or endangered just because of habitat destruction. And literally an animal like this could have the cure for cancer in its venom. So thank you guys. <laughs>